find a huge house, uh, build all electric homes, well, which I'll get into how I do that. And then if you're up for it as a home builder, support policies uh, which promote carbon neutrality and just transition. And so plenty of home builders are um, used to doing things the way they've done it or the way their predecessors have done it for decades. And um, when I talk to them as I do um, and try to convince them to do, build a better home and a more energy efficient home, um, sometimes I have to explain things in ways that are not related to climate change. Um, don't just build a home, energy efficient home because you care about climate change, maybe you don't, but there is a growing and significant consumer demand for homes that are energy efficient and that are better for the planet, uh, which was not true maybe 10, 15 years ago. But as I've noticed this, people come to me because they know we build a better home, more energy efficient home. But even people who come to my company uh, just seeking a home, when they learn about it, they're already primed to um, to be to get excited about the energy efficient aspects of the homes. That's a, a real change. And then even to the most fervent climate denier, who doesn't want a more comfortable, quieter, healthier, more durable home that's cheaper to operate overall? So you can you can sell these type of homes to to anyone, um, and they are very attractive. So how do we do it um, in in my company? We have for the last eight or nine years, uh, all of our single family homes have been built to a LEED standard, most of them certified through LEED, quite a bit of them um, to the highest standard of LEED, which is platinum. And I'll give you a couple case studies. Uh, currently, right now, we are building uh, seven houses. This shows eight. We built one several years ago um, in Woodlawn at Marquette and Kenwood. And that's, it shows the goal here is to, I'll go back to that, is to build um, these houses with rooftop full of solar panels. We're actually gonna put them on the garages as well. And the goal is to get these houses to where uh, they're net zero capable, meaning they're producing as much energy per year as the occupants are using or more. And how do you do that? It's a variety of things. First, you start with the building itself and you're making it as airtight as possible. You build it tight and ventilate right. You put as much insulation as you can into the home until you get to the point of diminishing returns. And then there's a lot of other little details. You're an all electric home. You're finding the most energy efficient heating and air conditioning systems, which is a heat pump, air source heat pump system. You're, um, you're using less water you're, um, you're putting in triple glazed windows and uh, there's a variety of things there. You'll see the, the list to the right that we do, the particular type of framing that reduces thermal bridging. And here's a little bit, I'll show you a little bit of how we do it. We insulate the outside of our foundations. That pink there is outside of our foundations, which we cover up with aluminum. The pink that you see there is part of our air sealing, which we pay attention to the air sealing all the way from under the basement slab all the way to the roof. The framing is called advanced framing. And in particular, we do a number of things like this, which is a double um, staggered stud wall. So these two by fours, you can weave insulation in and out of those instead of having you lose your heat through these studs that go all the way from the inside to the outside, you, you can insulate on either side of them. Insulation under the, the slab in the basement and on the sides of it keeps that within the thermal envelope of the house. Using a peel and stick advanced um, weather resistive barrier instead of Tyvek or others that are more typical, we get a really good air sealing in the home, which we test with a blower door. That's this. And make sure that it's airtight. You need to get a reading there. You, and then we use a type of insulation that's been around forever, made of recycled newspapers, which is cellulose insulation, which is excellent for all kinds of reasons, for 
sound insulation for taking on and releasing water or moisture and um, just is, has a great R value and adds to the air ceiling of the house. And there, there's our air source heat pump exterior unit, which is super quiet and is fantastic in all kinds of reasons. And our, we have, a, instead of a gas dryer, we have a um, electric air source heat pump dryer, which they've come a long way, as well as a water heater that's a heat pump water heater. Um, there's another picture of the same. And, and then nothing about these houses, or even if you were to energy retrofit an older house, has to be any different from the consumer occupant side. They can look and feel um, in every way the same. The only objection I ever get to having an all electric home and it doesn't last is that I love cooking with gas. We give every of our all of our home buyers a induction stove or induction stove top, which is fantastic, and um, they use them in at chef schools, and um, it's typically not an objection for very long. Benjamin. Yeah. So there's a question in the chat that I think is interesting. If you could maybe address it quickly, since you were just on that topic. Yeah, I don't know if I can see the chat. I can read it if you want. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know where Please I explain how ventilation and making a home airtight aren't at odds with each other. I have never understood. Sure. Very good. Um, yeah, it does seem a little counterintuitive to put a lot of effort into making a home airtight and then putting in fans and spending money to run fans uh, to ventilate them. But it is by far the accepted building science standard to, to build tight and ventilate right. So we really do make our homes as airtight as we possibly can. What we're trying to do is control how air enters our homes. Any older home uh, is leaky and air is coming in in various places where you're not controlling it at all. And you're not able to filter it. You're not able to tell what it's flowing through. So our homes, we have um, what are called energy recovery ventilators that run at a low speed constantly. They're bringing in fresh air constantly. They're filtering it. They're moving heat and moisture so that you're not just pouring cold air into your home in the middle of winter and exhausting heat that you've paid to, to heat. Same thing in the summer. So overall, that is a lower energy use than a typical home that's just leaky and it provides much higher quality overall indoor air than any of us are used to in an older home. Um, so, and then air sealing a home is the low hanging fruit of energy efficiency. So when we moved into this house, which is a 1920s house um, my wife grew up in. Um, first thing we did was hire a energy retrofit company to come and air seal it as much as possible. They did a blower door test before and after put insulation where we could get it, which is mostly in the attic and in some of the walls. And that had the most bang for the buck and is something we recommend anybody looking to make their older home more energy efficient to do first. Um, and then there's incentives to do that as well. I don't know if I answered the question enough, but get me back if you, if you want more on that. So I'm gonna run through, um, hopefully really quickly, a Example, this is a house we built uh, in Woodlawn uh, last couple of years. And uh, like all of our homes, rooftop full of solar, you can see it there. And I, I just got the energy ComEd bills uh, for a full year from the owner who's been there. And they have essentially achieved net zero. If you look at this, um, I didn't highlight it, but where I'm kind of circling it up here. Uh, from December 2019 to through November 2020, they used 10,578 kilowatts, 10.6 megawatts of electricity, while they produced 11.8. So they produced more than they used. And you can see how it, these two things are somewhat at odds, the orange being production from the solar panels and the blue being the use in the house because um, 
in the winter, which is here is December and January, the you're using a lot more because heat is such a highly, um, it's a high load of energy in the winter in Chicago. And you're not producing as much with the solar because the days are cloudy, the sun doesn't, isn't up in the sky as often as much uh, or as long and at a lower angle. So because those two are at odds, that's why we have net metering with our electric, electrical utility. And you basically can build up a credit during these summer months where you're producing a lot more than you're using and pull from it in the winter months. It goes from April to April. And here's a ComEd bill to show you. So this $17.69 is your lowest bill you're ever gonna get from ComEd. They're gonna charge you that just to provide their service. So that's the goal. And in this household, they saw that all last summer and fall. There it is. Um, so that's the goal. You can see also on here, I don't think you guys can probably see it, but it's it shows the how the a credit that they've built up is being applied against their bill. So they they're spending forty four dollars and seventy three cents in various things, and they're getting that credited. And down at the bottom, it just shows the rollover, how much excess they're having. Uh, that's going to roll over into their next month's bill. Now, if by the time April rolls around, if you still have those credits, you lose it. ComEd's never going to pay you uh, for the extra. But in that case, if you are doing that consistently, then it's already time to get an electric car, but definitely time to get an electric car. So you want to use that excess. So this is a little text heavy, but I also found, you know, there are other goals that we have as a company and I have personally in how we build and where we build in terms of uh, our development goals. And some of them are, you know, affordable housing whenever possible, working closely with neighborhoods, um, development without displacement as a goal. And I, this was also from that same article. And I found it interesting, 25 million households their energy bills supplant the purchase of food and medicine. So if we can get more energy efficient homes, get solar panels on people's homes where it's possible, uh, you're improving lives. You're letting people spend, you're basically increasing income in low income areas. And this study determined that half of residential buildings in low income neighborhoods in the United States are um, suitable for solar panels on the roof. So that's that's huge low hanging fruit. We can do something really meaningful there. Um, I didn't create a slide for policies that um, you know I think are are important to move this forward, but I can definitely talk about that if you want. But I'll I'll stop here and and take any questions you have. Yeah, we did have one um, question in the chat. Is retrofitting a leaky old house with air heat pump, wait, in retrofitting a leaky old house with air heat pump, would a backup gas heater make sense for below zero weather? So that's a really good question. Um, so I would say 10 to 15 years ago, you, a air source heat pump would always need a backup electric, like, we installed a heat pump system in our upstairs addition that when it gets, I would say when it gets 10 degrees or lower, mm -hmm. we have to put on this baseboard electric heat because it doesn't keep up. But now there's in the past 10 years, there's been an advance in heat pump systems where they pretty much can go down to minus 17. And homes are designed in Chicagoland to be built to where they can maintain their temperature down to minus 10. Now, we used to be able to say that it never got that cold in Chicago, so you're fine. But we all know that there have been a couple instances recently in the past five years where it's gotten to minus 20. So we do in our homes install at least a couple um, backup resistance electric heaters. Um, and you can always plug in a, um, a supplemental heat if it does get down that low. Um, but in, so like in the houses we're building at 45th and, and Calumet, we've got a couple 
a high BTU electric heaters, one in the basement, one on the first floor that will um, that can kick in if it gets that cold. So those don't cost that much. You're going to have to hire an electrician anyway to install um, an air source heat pump system. So when they do that, they can install a couple hundred dollar baseboard heaters or you know keep a couple in a closet somewhere. But that is, you know, that is one thing to consider. Um, Kathy was wondering, do you work outside of Chicago? Not currently. Um, in fact, I'm pretty, I'm limiting myself to just a, a handful of neighborhoods in Chicago right now. Um, but there are other builders who do similar work outside Chicago, depending uh, that can make referrals to them. I was curious too, are you the only builder in Chicago making all electric all electric homes? I don't think so. Um, I, to my knowledge, the only one that's building in low to mod income neighborhoods. Um, so I, I certainly wish there were more. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to share my knowledge and point people in the direction of resources so they could do it if they're interested. So that's a policy thing. How do we get to where we need to be with more of this, it has to happen with policies. Um, so energy codes have to be start to be enforced more strictly. Um, and there need to be carrots and sticks to get people to, to build um, all electric homes. So, yeah. and, and I need to promote what I've done so people can see that, you know, other builders see that I'm building and selling at a good rate and are curious as to what I'm doing. Um, but to, for them to make that jump from curiosity to actually doing it, there's a bit of a learning curve and I'm not sure there, um, a lot of them are willing to do it. Yeah, and um, really quick before I saw Sylvia has her hand raised, so really quick before that, but um, we're working with the Ready for 100 Collective, so trying to get Chicago on 100% renewable energy, and I worked on the renewable energy section where we're drafting a policy for the city to apply, and um, one of those was in our policy menu is to have policy where all homes have to be like all electric in new building. Um, I know California is doing that where they're building homes without natural gas. So if you have ever any have anything you want to add to that, <laughs> you could let me know. I do. I, I don't know if you have a contact. I have a yeah. contact um, who is a policy person on the environmental committee of city council. Oh, cool. So if you okay. want me to make that connection. Um, yeah, she actually cool. toured one of my homes, gave me her card and said, do you have any policies, mm. you know, you want to promote? And I'm like, wow, I'm sure I can come up with something. Yeah, um, that'd be great. I can share with you the policy menu we, are, we already created for renewables too. And see if yeah. you want to, yeah, that'd be great. Um, Sylvia, you have a hand up. Hi, yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry if you maybe covered it in this in the very beginning, um, but maybe you didn't is for people, for financing. Do you know if they encounter problems with mortgage companies or anything with wanting to go this way, or is it potentially even better financial, like from a financial standpoint to try to build a green line home like this? Um, most of the consumer financing that I encounter is we're already building a house and we're just selling it. So not something that somebody is buying land and building it um, with a construction loan. And I haven't encountered any problems. Well, I'd say the only thing is um, we run into friction with appraisers that are, not, um, that are not familiar with these type of homes. And it, that's a, um, a plus and a minus because if they do come back with a, a, a low value, uh, we can usually point out mistakes they've made and have a, a good reason to, to um, contest their lower value. Um, but in terms of the mortgage companies and, and their lending practices, I haven't seen any problems. Like nobody is tripped up over this type of home. Um, what I, there's, but there's still um, a leap they could take forward and where they could um, do what's called an energy efficient mortgage, where they are 
actually taking into account as a part of a person's um, income and expense balance sheet um, that they're going to spend less money on this home ultimately over time and should have more money to put toward a mortgage so could afford a greater, a larger mortgage. So allowing somebody to, to make that little leap from you know this amount to a, a bigger amount can allow them to afford one of these homes. So th those have existed, but I don't see them in wide circulation. Energy efficient mortgages. Great, thank you. Sure. I think Melissa has her hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, nice hi. to meet you, Benjamin. It's really great to hear about Green Line Homes. Thanks. Um, my question is, what's the typical cost for electrification per square foot for new construction and then also for a retrofit? Um, I don't have an easy answer. So um, people ask me how much more do my homes cost to build than another house? Um, and I don't have an easy answer because I haven't built just a code compliant house, you know, minimal required. Um, ever so um i think what i the i'm going to electrify our home you know we're we've been doing it as things die like as a water heater dies we replaced it with an electrical um with a uh, air source heat pump water heater and very soon we want to replace our old gas furnace with a mitsubishi system so stay tuned and I will document how much that costs. Um, I think at this point, it's only financially, just from a purely financial point of view, it's not gonna be attractive to do that. The systems cost a little bit more. You have to hire a plumber, not a plumber, an HVAC person, as well as an electrician, because you're gonna have to upgrade the, the um, electrical power to that point. Um, so sorry to not have a good answer, um, but the hope is that that type of incentive, that type of, um, that financial penalty for doing it has to be breached through policy, um, or else the vast majority of homes that need to be electrified won't be. Yeah, that, that's very true. Yep. Thanks. Sure. Now we justify the extra expense of our HVAC systems in our homes. They will cost more to operate um, from, you know, just a, if you didn't have solar panels on the roof, you would be paying more for your, um, to operate your heating and air conditioning system with a, even with a Mitsubishi system versus an old versus a natural gas system. But since you're producing this free electricity on your roof, it ends up being a, a, a bargain. So those two things together can make it more affordable. If you, if you have solar potential on a house, you put solar panels on it, you get all those incentives, which are real, and then you, you switch to all electric heating and um, air conditioning, you can save money. And Benjamin, just a point of clarification. So um, you mentioned electric furnace and you mentioned heat pump. Those are one and the same, right? The heat pumps electric or are they different? No, that's right. They're officially called um, air source heat pumps. They're moving heat around. In the summer, they're removing heat from your home. In the winter, they're sourcing heat from the outdoors and bringing it into your home. It's like a, a refrigerator that can work in both directions, oh, yeah, but, yeah. but much more efficient and high tech. I read conflicting information. Um, can solar panels increase the value of your home? Yeah. Um, the good thing about solar panels is they're quantifiable. You can turn them into a, a value now. It's a time value of money or um, there's another calculation for it for savings over time you can say what that's worth to me in a dollar amount right now um, so 
Yeah, definitely. There's a, there's been some studies too about, um, I guess it was more about lead certification or other certifications. Did those increase the value of a home? And, and it was shown to increase the value of a home. I forget the percentage, but um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, another thing I'm personally curious about is, as you know, and I think some others here know, um, my partner Matt and I bought one of your homes. We'll be moving in in May, so that's why I invited you because I'm really excited about it. And um, but you know, we are white people moving into a predominantly black neighborhood in Bronzeville, and so we've had conversations on do we feel like we're gentrifying? <laughs> and so um, I know you're building predominantly in Woodlawn and Bronzeville, so. Do you feel like people in those communities are buying the homes as well? Yeah, oh, for sure. Um, somebody was asking me about this, like who are my home buyers? Um, you know, that that is a very complex, multifaceted, long conversation type of <laughs> right. subject. But, you know, just some highlights are you know, there's a lot of young people who grew up in Bronzeville and Woodlawn who want to move back home, but want a new house. Um, and if those aren't available, then you don't get that, you know, multi-generational, you know, stability of a neighborhood. So that's one point. Um, well, a lot of my buyers are from, are moving from neighborhoods surrounding or including Woodlawn and Bronzeville. So. Mm -hmm. I've had people move moving from Hyde Park to Woodlawn, from Bronzeville to Woodlawn, from um, other you know so other South Side neighborhoods. Um, I would say pre-recession we were ninety-five percent of our buyers were pre two thousand eight two thousand nine recession were African Americans from the South Side in general or South Suburbs. Um, now it's a, a real mix. Um, your future neighbor is a uh, African American guy. Um, I don't have percentages off the top of my head, um, oh, but I'm just curious. yeah, I mean, your, you know, your your concern about that is you're not alone. Um, I'd say a lot of my home buyers are, you know, aware of that and, and concerned with that. But I think. Um, you're you're doing a good thing by by moving into you know your home there. Uh, we can talk about it a lot more, but um, you're you're welcome. You will I think you will feel welcome. Um, there, are a lot of the people who have lived in these neighborhoods for a long time are very happy to see their neighborhoods that are now attractive to a wider um, um, demographic. And, um, and, and they understand it's because their neighborhoods have improved. They've, been, they've lived there for decades. Crime is down. There are a lot of public improvements. Schools are getting better. When those things happen, the neighborhoods become more attractive to live in. Um, the overall, um, you know, the issue of displacement is, 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 is serious and needs to be addressed on a lot of levels, but it's mostly a, a public policy level. Um, there, there needs to be more affordable housing. There needs to be protection for, for seniors who've lived in neighborhoods a long time. We're way too dependent on property taxes to fund our schools. Um, so there's patches you can do against that, but really it is a, a deep public policy challenge, which is getting more attention. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Sure. Matt had a question. I think actually, yeah. uh, sorry, I've been sitting off screen over here, but uh, appreciate your talk. Um, and I think you you mentioned it. I guess I was curious why, uh, like, what what got you into development without displacement? Like, why that was important to you? And also potentially, like, why development? Why not uh, putting your efforts towards retrofitting old homes or or what that might look like? Um, so just hoping to get a, a little bit more of an understanding of of that idea for you. Sure. Um, so when I founded my company in 99, 
it was one of the, I had a list of values, which is still on my website. One of them I put in was development without displacement. It was at a time when uh, there were a lot of condo conversions and other, um, where they were basically buying an apartment building, kicking everybody out and gutting it or fixing it up and selling them as condos to, and almost never to the same people who once lived there. So that I would just saw that as something I don't want to have anything to do with that. I just, so that's, that was like a personal commitment to never kick anybody out of their house. Basically I've always built on vacant lots. Um, so we're never directly displacing anybody. Um, or if it's a tear down, it's a empty building. That's, you know, that's beyond its useful life or about to fall over. And we didn't do too many of those. Um, but it's, it's just part of a general commitment to work with communities and to try to use my knowledge and my capacity to serve the needs as best as possible. Um, why new construction? I got into it um, and then it became a specialization and you have to specialize. You have to just do one thing, do it well. If I were to be rehabbing houses half the time and building new construction, they would pretty much be two separate companies. Uh, they're two different animals. Um, that's a really important thing. Energy retrofits and rehabs are really important. There are plenty of people doing that. There are less people doing new construction at this level. So I feel satisfied that I'm doing something useful in sticking with new construction. Um, I do turn people away who want me to rehab their homes and I refer them to other people who can do it better than I can. So, does that answer your question? I mean, there's a longer version, I'm sure, but. No, yeah, that's great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Benjamin? Um, I would love to personally get rehab um, referrals of people with integrity and who will do a good job. Sure. Um, Melissa, will you share my email with everybody? So yes, just feel, feel free to reach out to me and give me a little more information as to what you're looking to do and I can refer you to people. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can connect you too. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? How many homes a year do you actually build? I have 14 under construction right now, which is a high water mark. Um, I'm not sure if I'll keep that at that level or expand or not. It just remains to be seen what, how much I can do. So I'm, I'm definitely in a, I would have been building three or four a year um, a few years ago, um, but 14 is a lot for me. But it, it, it's possible we could do more. Um, that, that's part of the reason I, when you do new construction, you can, particularly if you can build the same house or versions of it multiple times, it becomes, there's efficiencies there. The subcontractors become familiar with it instead of having to be on site to manage all these questions and all these details about a new house, you can say, go do the same house we just did. And it's a lot easier. So you'll, I've settled down onto like three home types. There's a 2200 square foot house, which is our standard, a 2700 and a 3300. And of the smaller home, which is definitely our preferred product, we can do a two flat version and then there's a there's even a 1400 square foot version that's uh, um, no basement. Anything else? Okay, hey, Lawana, thank you so much for your time, Benjamin. We really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through the incredible work you're doing in the city and um, wish you all the best. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. Your work is really important. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to, you know, listen to me and, and talk with me this morning. Great. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome to hang on or you can sign off. It's up to you. But um, now I'll talk a little bit about what 350 Chicago is doing. Um, so we are 
working on multiple campaigns. So one is the fossil fuel divestment campaign. So we are working to get this city to divest their operational budget from fossil fuels. Um, we have a meeting on Monday night to talk about strategy. So if anyone is interested in that, um, I'll type my email in the chat. So feel free to reach out to me to get more information. Um, and then up above in the chat, I'll reshare it, but we have our um, sign up form. So you can also get more information that way. Um, we are also part of, as I mentioned before, the Ready for 100 Collective. So this is led by the Sierra Club, but there's a whole bunch of organizations um, as part of the Ready for 100. And we are working to draft policy to get the city under 100% renewable energy by 2035 and 100% electrification of transportation by 2040. Um, so we are in the process of researching and developing policy menus around, renewable around renewables, transportation, jobs, holding the city accountable um, and so we are presenting all those ideas at the Ready for 100 collective meetings in April and May. Um, so feel free to participate in that. Um, and lastly, we're working on the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So um, Thursday night, we just had an awesome forum where we hosted Jen Walling of the Illinois Environmental Council, who's um, part of the Clean Jobs Coalition. We hosted Carrie Leiderson, who's a journalist uh, about renewable energy. And we also hosted Daniel Didick, who is um, a representative working on the, the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So we recorded that so you can look out uh, for that if you missed it. But yeah, if you're interested in helping us with any of our campaigns, we would love that. Um, and then we also are divided into subcommittees. So we have a research group, an outreach committee. So trying to bring new people into the group. We have education. So we plan these monthly meetings. We also have fundraising. Um, and on that note, let me share my screen to show you um, some upcoming events we have. Um, let's see. Can you guys see the upcoming events? Might still be loading. Can you all see that? I don't know if it shared the same screen. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we have an, our research committee. So April 13th, the research committee is meeting. Um, we have a fundraising committee. So on April 22nd, we're hosting an Earth Day trivia fundraiser. Um, so it's $20 a ticket for an individual or $40 for a household. Um, so if you wanna play trivia and win prizes, um, the winner of trivia gets a $100 Patagonia gift card. And then we have um, some other nominations of Patagonia gift cards. Um, and then um, on April 14th, we have a community solar presentation by the IMPACT team. So we're really looking forward to how we can get more community solar support in Chicago. And then our next two monthly meetings, um, May 1st, we're hosting the Democratic Socialists of America to learn more about the Democratized ComEd campaign. And then um, June 5th, we're hosting the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. So they can show us um, about eco-friendly water usage and managing the water of Chicago. Um, so those are just some upcoming events and we, we definitely need help planning these events. Um, we also have a newsletter. Um, Hannah, I don't know if you, did you wanna mention anything about the newsletter? Uh, let's see, or is, I don't know if Frank is still here. Yes, Frank is still here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we've had some more people express interest in being involved in the newsletter and um, we're actually meeting um, and trying to help me out here, I forget when we're meeting, yeah. um, Monday evening uh, at 6.30 with people who have expressed interest just to kind of do an, an onboarding and introduce them and talk about the tasks that go into compiling the newsletter, so. Awesome, cool. Yeah, so there's lots of ways to get involved, either um, helping us to run the group and disseminate information and educate folks to working on the campaigns. And we definitely need help strategizing around divestment. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is we're launching a divestment coalition. So we've only met four times so far, but we meet every other Monday and we're trying to get a statewide divestment campaign going on. So we're trying to get the state to divest its pension funds from the top 200 oil, coal, and natural gas companies. So that's definitely in early stages. So we would take all the help we can get if anyone's interested in helping us there. Um, but otherwise, it, um, does anyone have any questions about 350 Chicago? Um, 
do you guys have i'm trying to switch banks because i know bank of america is really horrible right like i they Mm -hmm. they fund like that pipeline or they're you know what i mean does anybody have suggestions of banks i could go to to switch to or anything and then that and then that have kind of plenty of physical locations where i might be able to get money for my laundry yeah (laughs) i feel that um yes we did actually do some research on better banking options and actually we did research too to find out where we should bank so we just became a nonprofit, and so we moved over our money too um so we do have that information and i can share it with you but sylvia not to put you on the spot but i don't know if you have any um anything to add there uh no actually i was trying to google the name but i think literally there's a website called betterbankingoptions.com or .org oh okay yeah. and it goes more towards cdfis which are community development financial institutions so that's like a community development bank or um or credit union which is technically okay. like a nonprofit bank you like a union membership bank type thing um, so yes, yeah, so you type in your zip code and you can find those like near you. Um, and also, you know, most banking is, doesn't need to be done in person these days. So your bank doesn't need to even actually be within your zip code. So that's up for consideration as well. Okay. That, thanks. That's a good tip. Yeah, I will chime in there again. Credit unions are democratically operated member organizations. So there's a fundamental difference between them and a bank straight up. So um, I don't know how uh, open credit union leadership is to campaigns like divestment or anything like that, because again, they're still a financial institution. Their, Their primary goal is to perform money operations, but, um, you, you have a much better chance of hearing your concerns heard at a credit union. So. That is correct, okay, that is correct. Yeah. Five, um, cre- credit unions, at least federal credit unions are technically 501c1. They're technically nonprofits. So it's a very oh, different structure. Um, there is a solar credit union out in Colorado. Melissa, do you know? I can't remember the name right now. Yeah, I was going to go back and look on our drive because we did do this research and we have it documented. So, and actually, Kimberly, would you mind um, sending me your email? You could do it via private chat if you want. Um, okay. And I can send you what we have. But yeah, sorry, I don't remember the Colorado one, Sylvia. Okay. All right. Yeah. But yeah, mm-hmm. great question. <laughs> After I move, I'm going to switch banks too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I hear that. Yeah. And I actually, um, I made the switch to a credit union from Chase about two years ago for similar reasons. You know, Chase is invest in fossil fuels. Um, and yeah, I've been, I've been really happy with it. So. Great. Thanks, Hannah. And if you're looking for credit cards uh, that are a good substitute for Chase or whatever dirty card you might have gotten for free. <laughs> right? um, I, I uh, found one uh, free ones from REI, uh, the, the, the camping gear membership place. Um, and actually I'm having to figure out what to do with my, I, I think I've got $600 that I need to spend somehow on camping and such sort of things make it that I've uh, earned over the year uh, because of spending uh, using my credit card. REI is one and Green America has one uh, that's out, uh, which I was pretty excited about. Um, wait, Green America is a bank or is, wait, what is it? Green America is not a bank and neither is REI. They're, they're just oh. putting out credit cards that are extremely oh. green and free and do really cool things for the environment. Oh, okay. That's okay, I didn't even know. This was not on my radar screen, okay. Okay, credit cards. I like Does that anybody have a card idea? <laughs> Does anybody have, has, um, suggestions about clothing um because when I go to I know that like workers are exploited like the cotton Mm -hmm. you know you know you 
uh, has a lot of pesticides to be made or or a lot of clothes are like what made out of oil like like all these synthetic things are actually from oil or something does anybody have like places they like to shop or you know what I mean like um and then like anything like that or does anybody have suggestions or no I like boutique um, or not boutique, just small business uh, consignment shops or like some which are, you know, more not exactly like Salvation Army or Goodwill, but it's this sort of idea of people donate or give their clothes that are still, you know, like fashionable, well-made, but they don't plan on wearing them anymore. And these stores will curate them and pick the best of the best. And so you can get, so this way you're not, you know, giving money to the company, you're giving money to a small business owner for something that's already been used, like reusing. Okay. So probably, okay. There's so plenty, there's plenty of stores like that in Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know many brands, but I know you can look for like third party certified things that might be better, like um, like cotton that uses less water or is organic, so doesn't use pesticides. Um, I know cotton's pretty water intensive, but um, yeah, I know there's like third-party certifications. I can't remember what they are right now, but um, you can always like look for that. Or I've also okay. been seeing that Target is making a lot of clothes out of recycled material. So I just bought a sweater made out of recycled water bottles. Oh. Um, yeah so I mean it's still like oil based but um at least it's like made from recycled material um and they're really nice quality like they're soft and durable um so I recommend that too oh that's nice okay and um if you look into what's called slow fashion huh. which is so kind of the opposite of you know we think of fast fashion where stuff goes into and out of style really quickly and is often not really made to last uh, but if you uh, look into slow fashion, you can find some brands for like new clothing that are, well, often um, they try to be ethical. So like Everlane, for example, tries to be transparent about their pricing and, you know, make sure that the workers are getting paid fairly and everything. Uh, but also the clothes are just made to last longer. So you're not buying new stuff and throwing it away and all that, you know, it's sort of better constructed and more style neutral. Mm. So it's not like going to be out of style next year. Um, so like Everlane is one of those. Um, let's see, trying to think of others. But yeah, there are various ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. Green America, uh, if you go to their website, um, you can search it and you will find the information you want about where uh, the certification and uh, there may actually be a Green America certification because they do things like that. Um, and they may have a list of uh, local places to look or uh, clothing brands to to check out. My friend likes unique uh Re resale shops in Chicago. Is that the brand or is that just you're it's just saying the name of the shop? Oh, okay. Uh, it's it's a resale shop, and uh, and it's not spelled uniquely because you know there are people with names named you anyway. But if that's a whole. Other I think subject. it's on Elston. Okay, unique on Elston. Okay, all right. It's probably just spelled. She unique, gets though. really <laughs> cool stuff there. She okay. is the perfect size to buy secondhand. Um, oh, yeah. Everything fits her, um, okay. but <laughs> we're not all that lucky. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sometimes you can hunt and pack and everything. So okay, okay. All right. Well, that's those are good leads. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I put a link in the chat that's got a list of um, sustainable clothing brands. Okay, thegoodtrade.com. Okay. And Benjamin said unique thrift is great. Unique thrift. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's really helpful, guys. Yeah, those are really good things to follow up on. 
Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, thank you everyone for joining us this Saturday morning. I know people are probably experiencing lots of Zoom fatigue, so we really appreciate you coming. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Benjamin. Bye-bye.